Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of the Faces of Business podcast, where we talk to interesting people about life and business. We cover their backgrounds, obstacles they've encountered, and find out what drives them. Along the way, our guests share nuggets you can use to drive your success. Reach me directly, D-A-M-O-N at ExitYourWay.us, or check out our website, ExitYourWay.us, for more information. I hope you enjoy our show. All right, everyone, welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, David Pistolka, and with me today, I've got none other than Jeff Lim. Jeff, thanks for being here today. Yeah, really excited to be here, David, and uh, thank you for having me. Oh, man, I am excited because, well, I get excited about inventory and warehousing, and, and we're going to be talking about the keys to inventory accuracy today, and this is something you've studied a bit, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and uh, I want to say you and I are probably the only people that really truly get excited about inventory. So. <laughs> so. Well, I, I tell you what, it's been a long time passion of mine because I, I really, honest to goodness, I was I was tasked with um, designing a warehouse in my second year of college, and I had no idea what I was doing, and uh, it turned out okay. But in the process of it, you do learn a lot. Uh, when you start to research and do it. So it's, it, it is something I've, I've, I've been around a bit, but let's talk about you, Jeff. So tell us a little bit about your background and kind of what got you interested in supply chain and inventory and, and really warehousing. Yeah. Well, I, I started off in the world of time and attendance, you know, tracking people. And uh, there was a, I had a pretty hard day. I remember sitting around my, uh, the boardroom table and there was this business card on the boardroom table. It was from one of the barcoding uh, companies, uh, a sales rep that left this card on the table. And it was from a company called Intermec, which later got purchased by Honeywell. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the card and said, you know what? This guy specializes in tracking boxes. And I bet you they're easier than tracking people. For, for these for time and tenant purposes. So we so I reached out and we launched uh, you know a barcoding business that resold their hardware and in the process we, you know, of selling that all that barcoding equipment which we later grew to be a national company doing millions of dollars of sales a year we had a little software business that helped us sell more hardware. So we built all the software that f really facilitated the collection of data and uploaded it to the host system, be it an ERP or an accounting package. And, and, and that's basically how I got started in the business, um, basically learning you know, the process of collecting data to support inventory moves. Okay. So what, what do you think, if you, if you look back on it and, and look at it as, as we're thinking about it today, what really has changed uh, the way inventories move. I've got some people that I know that are in with the handheld scanners and all this other stuff that's happening. So over the years, what do you think some of the most fundamental things that have really changed that have been exciting? Well, I think a lot of people certainly now are understanding the importance of the supply chain. And the warehouse is basically what I consider to be the crown jewel of that supply chain. Because you start messing up the warehouse, there's basically a domino effect around how it affects your supply chain. Because if you don't get your act right, where all the starts, all the inventory starts, and you start pushing that data and materials out the door, guess what? You're going to create a lot of havoc in your supply chain. So I'm seeing a far greater awareness around understanding the fundamentals of running your warehouse and a lot of interest in it. So, so when we deal with say manufacturers who are not natively fairly sophisticated, sophisticated around supply chains and inventory management, they're all ears. And a lot of them want to understand, you know, how do they better improve their warehouses, how they better improve their processes. And you know, that old trifecta, people, processes, and technology. Um, it's all about how do we affect those three areas to basically produce a better and more enlightened warehouse that's going to eventually create a competitive advantage uh, for folks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it is, it is, it is true. And I just want to say Gabe's on uh, saying hello. Great to see you, Gabe. Thanks for stopping by. 
Um, it, it, it is really, when you look at it, it doesn't matter if it's a raw materials warehouse or it's a finished goods warehouse. I mean, if your warehouse is not organized and accurate, you're going to have trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And, and exactly. And so, you know, I, I wrote a book to that effect, uh, called it, uh, your warehouse is not your fridge. And, uh, I came up with that title one day. And uh, it was around, you know, uh, I was having my breakfast. I did my little workout and sitting around the breakfast table. And in the mornings, uh, my kids, which were still living at home at the time, come rushing down in the morning. And it's basically every man for themselves because they're all trying to get to work or to school. And it's an all out assault on the fridge because not only do they have to get their breakfast ready, they also have to prepare their lunches, right? Because they're going to have lunch. And just watching them tear stuff out of the fridge, make their little, you know, luncheon things or their breakfast thing. And then they throw it back into the fridge in any order which they find it. And some of it they actually leave on the counter table for mom and dad to clean up. And I was, well, of looking course, at that, this- that part's left behind. That's yeah, right. Kids. That's right. It's always something's left behind. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at that. I said, my gosh, this is exactly how people treat their warehouses. You know, I mean, they, they, they come in there, they grab stuff out, they take it to the floor and sometimes it makes it back. And sometimes it doesn't um, uh, make it back where it's left on the floor. But the bottom line is there is no mom and dad looking after the thing. And they, eventually the warehouse becomes quite messy. And it be, and certainly it gets quite confused. So I did some further research, and you know that the average refrigerator in the United States wastes about 22% of the product that goes in there, right? It gets yeah. thrown out. I mean, everybody's but got that crisper, which is where all vegetables go to die, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the like crisper, right? You know, and like and, and like any and like a you know a, where, uh, a refrigerator, the more you stuff in your fridge the more likely you're not going to find it, right? Yeah. And so that's exactly what's happening with warehouses today, uh, especially as people are really buying more product or they're forced to buy more product due to shortages and longer lead times. And so we're seeing a lot of customers come to us and say, hey, we've reached the tipping point. Not only do we have more raw materials to track, we also got more work in process and we also have more finished goods to track. And by the way, we got to meet a delivery schedule. We've got we landed this new large retailer customer. They've got, say, 100 stores across the states. And now all of a sudden they say, don't deliver it all at once. Deliver it on this timeline to these DCs or to these stores. And yeah. by the way, also tell us how much inventory we have in stock at any time. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. yeah. And that's it is. It is. <clears throat> wow. You just described I mean, there, there's probably people that have chills just because you described them so so closely there because they're they're sitting here we we couldn't get it now we got our hands on some raw material so we bought you know twice what we normally would buy or four times or as as you said before maybe before we got on maybe even a year's worth of raw materials or materials and then you you have to try to get that out the door with more work in process or more inventory, whatever you're dealing with in, in your warehouse on a still on that stringent schedule of only ship so much to each location and, and uh, keep track of all yeah. of it. And uh, let's throw a few extra wrinkles in that. Now you talk to a 3PL or a third party logistics company, and they're going to manage your finished goods or manage your raw materials. Right? So now you've got to track them. Or you open yeah. up another warehouse across the street, and just the fundamental act of being able to control movements between warehouses yeah. is really tough for a lot of people. Yes, yes, I can't tell you how many times we've been. I've gone into companies, and it's like, oh, we got bu- busy, so we just bought this warehouse down the street or across town, and you go, uh, uh, just you just makes you shudder to think how much money that that waste if you don't do it intelligently That's and, right. and think about what you're doing. But uh, Gabe had a question for us. He said, how do you create a process that helps better forecast lead times for your merchandise? As this is a problem, problematic issue I've encountered in poorly managed supply chains. Yeah. Great question, Gabe. Yeah, I think I think and there that's a long answer to that one because there's a lot of different pieces in the process. But as you're talking now, one of the fundamentals is inventory accuracy. 
You got it. I was going to, you took the words right out of my mouth and uh, you can't create a proper forecast or without knowing what you really have on hand at any time. Right. And uh, short of having a really good crystal ball, you've got to have good accurate inventory and the fundamentals around accurate inventory are, you know, recording your, your put aways, recording your transfers, as I alluded to earlier, uh, recording your issue returns. If you're a manufacturing mm -hmm. issue and those returns back to stock and cycle counts. And I'm being very specific. It's cycle counts, not your annual physical yep. inventory count that, uh, uh, that I'm referring to. It really cycle counts is what, um, pushes the needle across towards, uh, more accurate inventories. So how much just on the, on the cycle counts, cause I I'm a big proponent of cycle counts and, and, and people have never used them before think I'm crazy because I say, listen, you got to do cycle counting. You got to do it. It's not, not even a, an option with me. You need to do it. How much does that really improve your inventory when you do inventory accuracy when you do it? If you just across the board, you mess with, you, you knowing about it and seeing it applied, how much does that really change it? Well, if you're doing it once a week, my preference if you do it daily yep. is that you're going to sharpen uh, your, your appreciation for what you truly have on, on hand. And it's not just the inventory accuracy, Damon, is you're going to be ensuring that there's better turns of that inventory. Because when you do a proper count, you're going to find stuff that's going to be possibly expiring. You know, uh, or it's obsolete and you should get it out of your, your warehouse. Cause if you get it into your production, um, you could end up having a costly yep. recall, um, not to mention uh, a bit of a loss of reputation and costs associated with that. So, you know, doing your accounts regularly is critical and we're not talking about having to do a staged inventory account. Like when, when folks do their annual physical count, yeah. they've got, they rope off areas, they, put stickers mm -hmm. on stuff that you shouldn't be counting. They have strict cutoff rules and it's all, it's all like a large game of mannequin. You know, when people go still and then yeah. they take the, that selfie picture of it, right? That's what it looks like. Everybody goes still. And then you do the count based on, on that stillness. And of course you're going to arrive at a pretty high accuracy level because you basically set it up to succeed. And mm -hmm. every breeze is big sigh of relief going, Oh good. We got, uh, inventory accuracy in the 90s so we don't need to do cycle counts it's totally wrong cycle counts serves the needs of the business and how you do your count is just as important as how frequently you do it so there's a number of different ways you can do your cycle count you could do it by location you could do it by your SKUs. Um, you could do it by activity level so that for example if you just had a large restocking or you've got locations that are run down to zero or even got negative locations where uh, the system has over issued from a location and it's driven into a negative. Those are the areas you need to count. And the last thing that everybody hears about is using ABCs. You know, you, you segment mm -hmm. your, your inventories and you categorize it into A levels, B levels and C levels um, based on either the value or the velocity of that inventory. Um, yeah. So it's a bit like a, a Pareto analysis, like the old 80-20 yep. rule, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, so if you set up your counts, and there's lots of good you know, WMS packages that will do your counts and schedule them for you. If you set up your counts and follow it regularly, it's like you know, flossing teeth. You should do it every day, right? You know, And, uh, and, it's, and again, it's going to save you a ton of time. So back to Gabe's earlier question, just having that accurate inventory is going to allow you to get a better handle as, as to how, what you really have on hand. And then you can use that inventory to, uh, to set up with your manufacturer to schedule it against your production schedule. And then looking at your lead time for the various products that you're going to be short, you can get ideas when you can really start that, that particular job or tell the customer you're going to have to short ship it. But at least you're doing yeah. it with confidence. Yeah, yeah, and that's great. And man, it, this the, the cycle counting is is such a savior because especially in in um, um, where if you're a, a, an e-commerce retailer, this is is critical. In in the days uh, in in the day of your latest review is your you know your best indicator if you're going to sell more or not you know if you run into something and you've got 
no inventory, but it says you've got a, you know, got a hundred of them on your website and you got 10 people that order them. And then you have to tell them they're going to put bad reviews on your site and that's going to hammer you. And, and uh, not only then it causes the supply chain problems because you got to hurry up and try to get them or whatever the deal is, but man, it, the, in the e-commerce world, the accurate inventory is so critical uh, just because the the high level of customer satisfaction you want to do. Uh, Gabe has another great question because you mentioned a WMS system. What are do you have some recommendations on systems that you particularly like? Oh, <laughs> uh, being particularly biased towards my package, yes. Yeah. I love our system. It's geared more for manufacturers. So it all depends on Gabe as to what business you're in. So if you're a food distributor or if you're a food manufacturer, um, the WMS obviously should support the needs of the business. And to properly understand the context in which you're going to um, use your product is you need to come up with a yeah, I'll call it a wish list. I call it your top five um, showstopper needs. And then from there, you would go shopping. And there's a, a ton of um, uh, WMS products out there um, that will suit your needs. I, I do encourage you to um, get together a group of people within your company, each representing the different departments that will be using that WMS and come up with a wish list and and I do have um, you know 10 steps that I that I that I discussed in my book and we have it available on our website as well where you can um, you know the step by step process by which you would uh, select a WMS and and part of it as well as creating what we call a vision board is where you get everybody together and it's sort of like you know a social thing but everybody uh, takes images or pictures from the internet or even from magazines, and it describes the state that they want their particular department or area to look like when you have your WMS. And then from there, you can quickly distill and come up with a common vision of, of what problem you're solving uh, for, your, for your particular problem. So for me to say, yes, go with ABC package, without knowing your needs is like, it's like me saying, you know, go, go, um, you know, what kind of car should I get? Right. Yeah. It's, it's never that easy, but it all comes down to understanding your requirements, understanding not only just requirements, but what it infrastructure you have, um, to support this package. Right. And eventually, you know, what problems are you trying to solve, you know, and, and, you know, the, the typical things that we're hearing from folks, the problems that they want solved are things like inventory management, labor efficiency, you know, what kind of um, labels have we seen a, a ton of manufacturers coming to us today and say, you know, help, help, help. We need to um, produce these type of AIG labels and they need it on every package, right, or every container mm -hmm. or, or bin um, that goes to them. Right. So we're seeing a lot of these requirements coming out of the woodworks and it's really impacting the type of WMS. And bear in mind, whatever you buy today, chances are three, four years from now, um, you're, you're going to be changing how you're using it. So you got to you got to make sure you work with a vendor who's constantly investing in growing their product keeping it current, not only technically, but also feature sets wise. And then ask them, you know, how do I get my needs? into your product when you guys create enhancements or upgrades is there a form for customers do you have a process for our voices to be heard you know we you know for example we have customer panels where we get customers engaged on particular areas like for example we just had one on vendor consignments you know although that's not happening so often these days where, you know this is where a vendor mm -hmm. sends you product in advance you know you store it on site at your place and when you consume that product or, or ship it out, then you tell your vendor, send me an invoice for it. Well, that takes a lot of trust for a vendor to do that. And a lot of systems are not robust enough or transparent enough to offer that view to the vendor saying, here's what we have on yeah. hand, here's what we consume, and here's what you can invoice for, right? So that was really critical. And then the, of course the customer being our customers said, but we also are on the other side of the fence and we ship our stuff to our customers. What are you going to do for us there? I go, okay, that's going to be chapter two of our customer panel. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But well, that's a, that's a great point though. You, you, you showed a, a really cool uh, example of something that's actually pretty tough. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's something that's common, but it's, it's hard. How do you, how do you let your suppliers look into your inventory? And then how do you let your customers look into the inventory? Uh, if you're keeping product for them and they can get it when they want or whatever it is. So there's so many different ways that that works. Cause I've been in manufacturing before where we manage the, the inventory at the supplier's location even, which is different again. And you talked about food service. I know they do that. And there's a lot of industries where that is common. Uh, so yeah, it's it's really something. Well, it's just it's as simple as as going going to the grocery store and going in and get and getting milk out of the the grocery store. A lot of times, the the manufacturers are managing the inventory in the stores. Yeah, they're they're restocking the shelves. They're doing inventory counts, you know. And and you know that's assuming you're big enough to do that, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, if you're a mid size, small size manufacturer, you know. For you to get that consignment arrangement, A, you got to have a very good relationship and obviously credit score with your supplier. Yep. But yep. They, not, they may not send anybody on site to your place. So now you've got to have the processes and the system for which you can accurately and and uh, and, and on a timely basis record what's what's going on with that person's inventory. Yeah. Yeah, that's for that's for sure. And it's 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 a tall order sometimes, especially if you're not big enough to really support it. Well, that's a great point. Well, Ingor, thanks so much for being here today. Great to see you. And then uh, Ingor says hello to Gabe and, and Gabe said, great answer. Thanks for giving me some awesome information. So that's that's really what what uh, I mean, you brought so much there in, in that little bit because because <laughs> it's like it's like yeah it, it all comes down to simple fundamentals in in inventory accuracy it really does and you said there's four keys to it so we talked about cycle counting a little bit what what are some of the other areas where you see that people are making mistakes with their inventory accuracy yeah yeah it's uh uh, on the inbound side of things, I mean, Ooh. most most people do a great job of receiving their materials because obviously they want to receive it accurately and timely because they're going to be paying um, yeah. you know, money against the materials received, right? But after it's received, the way they put it away is sort of like, ah, oh, geez, guys, you know, you got to, they're not recording that put away. They're kind of, you know, and a lot of ERP systems will do what we call an automatic put away to its primary location. So it yeah. automatically goes into, say, a, a uh, location A101, right? But what happens is a guy gets to A101 with the product, ABC, it goes A101. He looks at A101 and goes, oh, damn, it's full. Yeah. Right? So he puts it in B101, right? Yeah. Right next no to big it. Deal. Right? It's real close. They can see it. Fine. Yeah, no big deal, right? But guess what? The inventory system or the ERP system thinks it's an A101. And when you go to do what we call a back flush in your manufacturing side of it, it will consume materials from A101 and there's your negative. Yeah. And meanwhile, it's sitting in B101. And they only find out about it till after they do a count. Yeah. Who knows, who knows when, right? So now this product ABC is MIA. Let me yeah. use another acronym, right? So, so on and on it goes, and this is repeated hundreds of times, right? So, uh, so as I said earlier, they do a great job receiving and even labeling it, but when it comes to the put away, it's kind of like laissez faire. Um, Everybody does it a little different, and some guys scan it, some guys record it, some guys don't do it all at all. We had a customer, his biggest job every day. And this is the manager would go back there and just do an audit to check that everything is in the place it is. So he's walking around with a handheld terminal yeah. um, using our, our, our software and he's, he'll go in and check to make sure, right? Then they, they force the process to be scanning that location it goes into. I don't care if the system, if it's, you're putting it away into its prime location. I want to verify that you're scanning it, slow them down a bit, but guess what? It saved the manager two hours a day having to do the audit. And yeah. all of a sudden, he went from like fearing the inventory that he sees on this system going, oh, that doesn't look accurate, to knowing um, that that inventory they see on the shelf is exactly what's there. And then when you're yeah. telling a customer or you're planning production, it just gets that much more easier. Yeah. Yeah. Because 
if you're the one that has to tell the production department that the the components that you thought were there are not there you're not very popular that day yeah yeah. especially if it's a minor component and it's an expensive product that they need to ship because it, it it's the last piece or one of the critical pieces oh, yeah especially yeah. today i mean oh yeah it's everything yesterday and uh you know there's not a lot of room for error and um to your earlier point around e-commerce because you know typically on an e-commerce order there's it's only one to three lines max so you if you do a, a pick error on uh, one to three lines, you know, your pick error is going to be 33%. That's yeah. just one line, right? So, yeah. so you've got to be super accurate. And uh, yeah, you that's know, a great and, point. That's a great point. Cause you're not picking a hundred items on an e-commerce. If you want to get really high pick accuracy, you've got to be good. Yeah. Well, you have the, the average order is one, one item on each line. So you might yeah. have three lines and three items. And if you miss one of them, you're yeah. now 66% or 67% accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. That's right. Wow. And when you look at this, if, if you, if you're doing things better, just, just marginally better, you're doing half the stuff that you're supposed to do how much of a labor difference does this make? Because you're not looking for things. You're not blah, blah, blah. The, the, all the myriad of things that happens when you don't put stuff away or you, you're, it's not the right spot. How much of a labor savings do you see in a warehouse when you're doing that? Well, one of our customers is fond of saying that, you know, when he um, put in the system, um, there was a lot of skepticism, you know, his big brother was watching us and stuff yeah. like that. But within a few months, the the warehouse guys would come up to him and go, you know, we love the system. We love the system. And they go and they go, why? Because so, these guys would walk on average in a warehouse anywhere between two to four miles a day, right? Looking for stuff. And yeah. So, now we don't have to walk down this big long hundred foot aisle because I just go, I just look up on the device and I know if it's in that aisle or not. You know, I, I can't tell you how much time it saved me, right? And basically. Wow. And so basically he says, says this lookup feature pay for the entire system itself because the guys are happy. And when they, and when they save some time, they're more likely to scan the product into the location. So it's that simple thing. And then of course there's a domino effect and pretty soon the accuracy seller starts coming up, it raises all boats. They could produce more accurately. They could ship more accurately. And, you know, pretty soon you've got a competitive advantage. And you've got this notion of inventory turns, which you've uh, likely heard about. Their turns start going up. And once yeah. your turns start going up, uh, what's what I call magic happens. You start being able to ship more product, store more product, the same amount of space and people. It's yeah. Cool. Yeah, it is. And and when, when you lose sight of turns, it can be an ugly thing. Yeah, it can be an ugly thing, and and we've had it before where where growth and and then just growth has has really the focus comes away from being an efficient operation into getting stuff out the door. And when that happens, you can really um, you can lose sight of the turns, you can lose sight of the accuracy. There's just so much stuff that that'll happen, and and those costs just creep in and pretty soon you've got to wear it. You know, you've got a hundred thousand square feet and I've got, you know, whatever it is, 40, 50 people out there now. And, and now I've got 50 or 60 when I know I really should have 40. And yeah. because we're, we're doing things inefficiently, we're moving things twice, especially as that warehouse gets full. The, yeah. When it, when it gets, when a warehouse is at just about maximum capacity, it is ugly if stuff is not accurate yeah. and not put in the right spot. Well, you, you get the situation where you got product on the floor and the aisles and the yard, and it just becomes a uh, uh, almost like a best guess where stuff yeah. is, and you and people are relying on their memories, and not going to happen. So, yeah. so it's really crit it's really critical to you know be efficient in your labor and to have this information that people can trust. And all of a sudden, you know, it's a uh, uh, that little act of just recording, you know, where stuff is, um, yeah. is, a, is a big step in the right direction in terms of just improving inventory accuracies. Yeah. So you've got a couple more, couple more of your, your keys to inventory accuracy. Let's talk about the next one. Cause we hit cycle counts and, and put aways. Yeah. Yeah. The next one is, you know, transfers, right. And transfers oh. is a big thing because, um, you know, people do 
uh, basic transfers between location one to location two. So you might be um, bringing down, um, moving stuff from the box storage down to the, the pick face. That's yeah. a transfer. Or you could be doing a, a bigger transfer, like moving product from warehouse A to, to warehouse B, mm -hmm. right? Or moving it offsite to a 3PL, right? Or doing uh, what we have, um, we call this thing called outside service, where a manufacturer will take product that um, is in a semi-finished state and send it to a third-party vendor for say galvanizing yeah. or coating, right? And so that product is now being transferred to that other facility and then it needs to come back. So the question is how well do you track those transfers, right? Even moving yeah. the simple act of transferring material from the warehouse to say production or to what we call the marketplace, Within the uh, manufacturing area, where you take kitted products that are ready for production, you put them in what we call a marketplace. And then when they're ready to run their jobs, they move from the marketplace to production, or you move it directly to the production floor if you have uh, mm -hmm. a big enough staging area. So those transfers are really critical and you need to track it. We uh, I, I talked to a, a prospect uh, once and they build up to, I think it was up to 200 of these kits you know, out there on the floor at any time, right? And what they did was that they not only just transferred it from the warehouse, they actually issued it, pre-issued it to the jobs, even though they weren't started yet. Meanwhile, the actual inventory waiting to be actually started in production was actually sitting there in, uh, in, a, in a box uh, near the near the production area or near the first machine that was going to start processing it. So their inventory was constantly had to be updated. And they actually had a person who went around checking um, the and, and scanning it and recording these kits that were pre-built mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. no, we haven't started this one. We haven't started this one. And then they would do a little adjustment <clears throat> in the inventory um, to show that, you know, really we have this on hand. This wow. um, this waiting to be in production, and these goods are actually uh, being consumed or have been consumed. Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty scary. Wow, wow, that is pretty crazy. And and you know when you talk about transfers, I think back to when I was in the aerospace industry and we had making components. And you think about uh, you know a titanium component for for an airplane, it might go out to three, four or five different processors before it comes back to you again. How the heck do you track it all out there and keep, uh, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, I'm yeah, sure it's, it's, it's not easy. And, um, you know, we, we have, a we actually have a little workaround to do that, you know, oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. But, but it's, it's, it's just a question of tracking that it's at this particular vendor. Mm -hmm. Right. And and what we do is we set up a location in our system called that vendor. Yeah. So if you're sending it to Mr. Painter or Mr. Galvanizer or Mr. Yeah. Coding, then you have a location called coding and then yeah. maybe the uh, an ac brief acronym of that of that particular vendor. And you transfer um, those work and process goods, which we put on what we call a license plate. Yeah. Or, or we, we, in actuality, we call it con, uh, assigned to a container code. So you would, in the system, transfer that container code to that location called vendor ABC or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And it's then when you look up your inventory, you see all the products and containers that are at vendor ABC, right? Then when it comes back, right? You receive that against a purchase order, which you've issued at vendor ABC, and you make sure you transfer the goods from that location in your facility back to the production line. And so now you've got some visibility and understanding as to what's happened to that particular work and process goods. So, well, yeah, because if you're not tracking it, you're really guessing on what your work and process inventory <laughs> value is where it's at i mean yeah you got purchase orders but you really don't know from a system standpoint where it's at, at that you don't point. know actually when it went to them yeah so oh so great now, point so now you could you now you got this report that will tell you it was transferred in uh, at this time and date into this location and that's yeah. when it was shipped to the vendor right so so it's well, all it's all pretty it's pretty straightforward and we, we had a number of customers who who approached us with that problem it wasn't me who, who thought of it it was it was them saying hey, we have a, we need a way to track it and i say okay just we'll create a virtual location one for each of your vendors and you transfer it in there while you're really physically shipping it out the door to them 
Yeah. Well, that's great. That's great because it's it shows that how the the customer driven focus of of your company you're able to move on the fly and help them solve those problems. Yeah, I that's mean good. that's that's that that's my passion is you know our, our mission at our company is to literally make lives of our customers better. I mean, I get a, a big kick here in their stories where uh, one fellow we solved their their ability to print a pack list. Um, for whatever reason, the ERP was producing the pack list. It took up to 10 minutes to produce a single pack list. And, oh, wow. uh, and when it came time for you know, UPS or the carrier to pick up the products, they'd be waiting around for the pack list to print. And they gave this poor shipper no, uh, a lot of grief. So it was a very stressful situation. Mm-hmm. And they always end up, you know, working late and missing dinner. Fast forward, they put in our system. We're now printing pack lists in under 10 seconds. And they're all out there on the parcels. So when the yeah. driver arrives, it's all there. They load. And he goes, I'm able to have dinner with my family every day by 6 o'clock. It's, yeah. been, it's been a game changer for me. And, and that's the big – I can't ROI that. I can't even even put it in a testimonial for why our system is, is wonderful or whatever. But it's that kind of stuff which allows people to have a better life. Um, yeah. That makes me feel great. I can't – you know. I get yeah. chills even talking about it today. Oh yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So, so you're you're out doing this work, and 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 what really made you decide? Hey, we need to we need to develop a, a software system to to help warehouse. Oh, and you well, make a WMS. What what, what just kind of triggers your mind one day, and you go, we yeah. need to do this. Yeah, great question, David. It was pain, you know, the, the fact that people would show me their their current systems. I go. You gotta be kidding me! You're doing that. You're having to do this, or you, or, or the system, or you having to use spreadsheets to augment what your system. I mean, the computer should be doing that kind of thinking. So, what what we try to do is engineer a product that you know that is as least intrusive as possible, and it's done uh, almost as a byproduct or or as they uh, commit their tasks. So, so when we create a product, our product in particular, I mean, we try to set it up so that it actually helps them do their job better. So it's not uh-huh. like a, a time and attendance system back to my early days where we're tracking people, where people had to clock in, clock out, and they did that because they want to get paid, right? Mm-hmm. And also, you know, clocking in on jobs, clocking out of jobs. And in those kind of situations, there's no value add to the manufacturing process. Right. I mean, clocking in, clocking out for payroll. Yeah, people get it. Right. But when you clock in, clock out on each job, most machine operators look at that as a burden Mm -hmm. because it's going to slow them down. The warehouse, on the other hand, it actually we actually make them better at their jobs. So, you know, there's we have one customer testimonial um, when he, he jokingly asked his warehouse workers, you know, if we took our plus our product away from you today, what would you do? And this workers all said we quit. <laughs> oh, that's a nice testimonial, right? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. but nonetheless, you know, it, it's a whole idea of how do we engineer the product so that it works and supports the process. So we're not, we're not just merely capturing data. And that's the big difference, Damon, is that we're not here to do help you record the data. We're actually supporting you and helping you make better decisions around which product to pick uh, from where and where to take it to. So, and we also will organize the pick in such a way that it's gonna help you become most efficient in terms of building that pallet so it doesn't tip over. So you're picking wow. typically the heaviest stuff first and then you're building it from there, right? So, wow, that's so cool. So little things like that. Yeah, well, I mean, and that shows that the warehouse knowledge too, right? Because a, a simple system will just spit out everything. Hey, this all needs to go in the shipment. But yeah. when you think about, the the physical task of building a pallet out if you put the heavy stuff on the top we all know what happens is you end up reshipping more because it's lost somewhere in the middle between here and there and uh, uh but that's that's awesome so when you when you got into this did were you really did you really think that you summarized the challenges you were going to see in, in doing this with your business or was it, was it a bit more than you thought after you got into it? Yeah. Our, our first project 
way back when was with you know liquor control board of ontario which is at that time was the largest liquor warehouse or distribution center in the world oh wow we won, we won that project i have three employees and uh oh, we, my. Were, we were supposed to automate uh 28 sortation conveyor lanes um and then put a pallet on it put a label on each pallet and then also support what they call the non-conveyables, which is a pick area for products you can't put on a conveyor. And also the more expensive liqueurs and wines, right, that were mm -hmm. hand-picked and put on the pallets, right? Um, that was a million-dollar RFP that we won. Wow. Right? And it was quite the uh, wake-up call, you know? Yeah. And, uh, we were the first to actually come up with a, a, a system that ran on, on then PCs. And, uh, wow. and PC technologies. We were the only vendor that did it. Um, kudos to them. They had faith in us. We pulled it off. They, they used the system for over 12 years. And about a few years ago, they replaced it with a robotic arm from Germany. Um, but that was our claim to fame. Our system processed daily 150,000 cases a day. <clears throat> and it was wow. quite, uh, we, won, we won a number of awards for it. Um, but that's how I learned the business, the honest way. And to your earlier question, I later went on to get some formal education around warehousing. I have a professional designation in materials management. I'm also the director of education for the Material Handling Society of Ontario, where we help design courses and help you learn about all sorts of minutia about warehouses so you can actually win at any true or pursuit game um, yeah. on warehousing if, if you get invited to one. Talk about these courses a little bit, because because before we got on, you were explaining you're you're taking these material handling courses um, um, from the Material Handling Society of Ontario and, and putting them online. But these are not your typical five minute video type courses. Explain this. And then because it is, it's significant what you what you've done there. Yeah, the program is broken out into four modules, you know, modules one through four. And, and each module has about, uh, I'd say about anywhere between 10 to 12 chapters. Each chapter is anywhere from um, 20 to 50 pages in length. Uh, uh, reading of each um, module requires a major project at the end of, end of each module. Um, there's a series of assignments. And then when you've done all four modules, which is typically about 48 chapters, you know, 18, uh, ooh, about 40 assignments and four major wow. projects. You get to write a final exam, uh, three hours. And if you pass, you get a PMM, a professional materials management. So um, it's very detailed. Um, Damon, I, I, I knew a lot uh, in the warehousing business before I started these courses about six years ago. And when I came through it, I went, wow, I know. I know some pretty crazy stuff that would uh, win you kudos in the Trivial Pursuit game, but by and large, you you develop a certain level of confidence yeah. about anything pertaining to warehousing because we've covered everything from, you know, obviously how to design a warehouse, what kind of material handling equipment you use it, to health and safety, yeah. how to do, how to deploy projects, how to do time motion studies, you know, how to use uh, uh, statistical processing to now analyze how long uh, certain process should take and what's the, uh, you know, your confidence level, et cetera. So um, it's an amazing course. It's really a one of a kind of, wow. of it in the world that I've, I've never heard of. Most uh, supply chain courses focus a lot on procurement and rightly yeah. so, but this one really focuses on warehousing. And if you want to know the warehouse business, totally recommend it. I'm a little yeah. biased. Well, no, I, I, I'm serious. When you were talking about it, I'm like, if somebody really wants to understand warehousing, you just don't find training like that. Yeah. And it is, it is cool. And that's from the Material Handling Society of Ontario, correct? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Material Handling Society of Ontario. So if anyone's listening, check that out. Because if you're into warehousing and you want to learn a lot more, that, that might be a good Oh, a good yeah. place to go and, or reach out to me and i could certainly send you some you know course yeah. outline information etc and we're also partnering with uh, lift trucks and they're actually uh, working to put all our course material online and we should have the first module um, set up and running by the end of december wow i'm very, I'm very just putting the last finishing touches and it's it's been quite a endeavor because everything was, you know, binders and paper. Yeah. And we now it's all digitized with videos, voiceovers, quizzes. So it's, wow. it's, it's a proper, you know, 
more modern content as well. That's incredible. That's incredible, man, because it it is. I mean, when you look at it, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, you can learn a warehouse by working in a warehouse, managing a warehouse and other things. But if you really want to take it to the next level and be a warehouse professional, these are the kind of resources you can use to, to really make that difference. And uh, like you said, you may not need to know it all, but but having a good rounded uh, knowledge of of the the warehouse and and how to operate and all the other things you talked about there is is definitely beneficial. Oh, that's cool as heck. So what what do you think is the, the the next exciting thing? I know everybody's talk about supply chain. We can beat that to death forever. We don't have enough of everything. But what what do you think is really exciting in warehousing now that you go, man? When that comes out, this is really going to be cool. Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I have I have a, a passion project, you know. Okay. This is, this is a bit of my legacy I want to leave to the industry. It's called our, our smart warehouse, right? And and the smart warehouse that we're working on is founded on a couple of additional technologies that I think will take the whole WMS field to the or to the next level. Uh-huh. Um bar, most WMSs uh, are founded on two principal technologies, barcoding and wireless. Right? Mm-hmm. Those are great technologies for tracking boxes, right? But a lot depends, uh, but they're terrible technologies for tracking people. You know, back mm-hmm. to the people thing, right? I mean, the, the, the and, and as we all know, people move the boxes. And yes, yeah. we're, we're, we're replacing people with more automation instead. But for most companies, certainly most small, mid-sized manufacturers and distribution said, people are going to be your most flexible resource and able resource to help you Yep. Move the boxes. So the question is, how do we make those people more efficient? And this is where this new set of technologies that we're working on currently, um, one with AI, is we're going to start by modeling your best workers in your facility, right? So I'm now going to build a persona, uh, which is your best pickers, your best put away guys. And from that, I'm going to do something pretty crazy, which manufacturers have, uh, have used all their lives, is standards benchmarks right i mean I'm, I'm holding up a pen here whoever made this pen could tell you you know to this to the penny how much material went in there how much time yeah. went in to produce it but they couldn't tell you how much time it took to move this pen around right mm-hmm. and material handling processes you know account for up to 30 percent of the product's cost you need wow. to take into account carrying costs and storage etc so why aren't you tracking that cost because you know what they don't know how Right. Yeah. So the next generation of WMS systems will have the ability to actually create standards around what uh, material movements should, how long it should take. And to help with that, we're not only going to use AI to help learn or do machine learning around what your standards should be, but we're also going to actually be able to start tracking people as they move through the facility. So think about an internal GPS. So we're going to be able to do things like wayfinding in a facility. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in a large 250,000 square yeah. foot facility, it's very easy to get lost, let alone you plan your routes, right? We're also going to use that indoor positioning technology to track who's where and then be able to create, do what we call task assignments and be able to set, assign tasks to the appropriate person based on their location and availability. Wow. How's that for a crazy idea, right? That's that's incredible, man. Yeah, yeah. So. So we're, we're coming up with a number of different technologies to support that. And then, uh, and then basically allow us to not only model after your best workers, do wayfinding, but then assign tasks to people who are available to do those tasks. So a, a lot of companies now, especially in the manufacturing, have their material handlers who are siloed. Yeah. So, that, so they have, say, a group of 15 material handlers, and they're typically assigned to a few machine areas and they Mm -hmm. and their job is to basically keep those machines running or keep those um operators busy with by by supplying the materials so they'll do what we call drive-bys and go you need it how you doing etc right well what will happen is that you end up having other guys who end up running late or getting busy somebody has a mechanical or somebody doesn't has an upset stomach and all of a sudden you're now short a guy but guess what the other guys can't help them because they don't know what's going on yeah. So what our tech will do is that, is that instead of having you these solid workers, we're going to be able to go back to the future, which is how it used to be before they, they went solid, and have teams of workers, right? And I'll be able to dynamically flex and create these teams wow. and assign tasks to the appropriate people who are available. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, it makes total sense, right? And so we're going to be rolling out that as a pilot very soon at a, at a tier one parts um, auto parts manufacturer. We're exactly having that problem. They're trying to, um, they're adding additional lines because they finally got mm-hmm. some chips. And now they're yeah. ramping up production. They're going to be producing, you know, another, I think they're, the goal is to do support the production of 900 cars a day. And wow. they've added more lines, but they don't want to add more material handlers. Right? Yeah. But they know they're siloed. So what they want to do is break that mold and have them work as a team. And so now they'll be able to, you know, work together to basically support an entire group of uh, machines and, and equipment. So that's the future. It's uh, a more, how they call it, a ware, warehouse or, or, or facility yeah. around material handling. And it's based on standards so that you can scale your warehouse as well as schedule your work um, based on all the potential movements that are going to happen in mm-hmm. a day and then track them to see how they're doing. And that's one thing automotive um, parts manufacturers love to do is they love to track stuff. I mean, like I said, they, they can yeah. tell you down to the penny what it costs to make stuff, but they have no idea what it costs to move stuff. Wow. That's super cool. That's super cool. And when you think about it from the business perspective, you know, and, and, uh, it, it is, you, there is a lot of wasted labor in that, in that part of your, cause they've, you know, you've lean manufactured all out of your work centers. You've lean manufactured it even in your shipping and, and receiving and these other areas, but that movement is still largely, uh, based on the person just going to go from here to there, they're going to take it, whatever they want. And if you think about, like you said, in a large warehouse, 250,000 square foot warehouse or something, even some of these even bigger, you go, I can get lost. I can take not an efficient route. And then when you talk about the team aspect of this, if I'm in a manufacturing setting where we've got 10, 15, 50 people, whatever it is that are supplying all these every areas. Just like you said, if somebody somebody gets sick, a, a forklift breaks down, something happens and, and someone else it just gets notified on their on their device that it's, hey, you need to go take this from there to there. That's awesome because you're going to be the efficiency in that's going to go up dramatically. Yeah, I mean, right now somebody gets sick or had a mechanical, it's, it becomes 911. The supervisor gets called. The operator, machine operator, goes, "Hey, Joe isn't here. I haven't seen him around. He hasn't done his done his yeah. milk run." And, and the supervisor starts looking for Joe, and before you know it, he's he's um, driving a lift truck himself, yeah, bring material to the line. So it's yeah. a very stressful environment. And so what we're trying to do is is take these little bumps and just uh, and just uh, roll with them. Which is yeah. which is all everybody wants. They want a system that could, you know, basically self heal, and um, basically flex as required. Um, and so that's a bit of my passion project. We um, we've got a lot of, um, you know, we're having a lot of fun doing it. And, uh, oh, I bet, and I so, bet. You know, it keeps I bet. me it keeps me going. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, we keep us updated on that, Jeff. It's 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 so awesome. Like we could talk a lot longer because like you said, some people would think warehouses and, and inventory is boring, but man, it, it, it is critical to business. And, and you've shown us that today with your, with just the bits you shared about inventory accuracy. And it's so exciting about your, your warehouse management software and your system that you have and the, and the new developments that you're having. So thanks so much for being here today, Jeff. Yeah, I really enjoyed it today. And, you know, I love this topic. It defied somebody who <laughs> shares the same views. It's a, it's great. You know, yeah, I certainly yeah. can't go over and talk to my wife or kids about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they look at us kind of funny if we talk about some of this stuff, don't they? Yeah, it, it's but true. it's good. It's good. So thanks so much for being here today. We've been talking with Jim, Jeff Lem about inventory accuracy. Now, Jeff, your company is called Portable Intelligence. And your software system is called RF plus RF plus. Yes. All right. So if anyone's looking for that, they can do that. And if you can, you can connect with Jeff on LinkedIn as well, but thanks so much for being here. Thanks everyone for listening tonight. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And we'll be back again after Thanksgiving with, with some more guests on the faces of business. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs>